Stanford University. I'm really excited. Um, this is about cancer. I'm a cancer surgeon. I actually just left the operating room. I operated on two patients with cancer, and I today, needless to say, I wish I wouldn't have to do that. As much as I like operating, I could find other things to operate on. But uh, tonight, we're going to tell a story of cancer, and we have two very distinguished uh, professors from Stanford. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Phil Beachy. He's actually a professor of developmental biology and a member of the Stem Cell Institute. And he works in developmental signaling in embryos and stem cells. And he works specifically on one of my favorite proteins to call. It's the hedgehog protein, because <laughs> that's just a fun word to sort of say. <laughs> then our second speaker is going to be Dr. Ron Levy. Ron Levy is probably one of our most distinguished uh, cancer doctors at Stanford. People come from all over the world to uh, see him. And in fact, he's taking care of some friends of mine. Uh, I don't know if he knows that. Uh, he is actually a professor of medicine oncology, our chief of the oncology division. He's in our cancer center. And he's going to speak about one of his interests, which is using the immune system to treat cancer. We're going to follow the same format. So uh, they'll be asking for questions throughout. So feel free to ask. And Dr. Beach, he's going to start first. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be able to kick off the, uh, the first um, part of this tag team uh, match that we have. And uh, I'm not actually formally trained medically. It doesn't count, I guess, that my wife is a neurologist. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, I have, um, over the years, uh, spent a lot of time uh, carrying out research on topics that are related to cancer. And so uh, what I'm going to give you is a perspective that I think will be a bit different from that of, uh, of a real cancer doc, which is Ron. Um, but I hope that between the two of us, we'll be able to give you some feeling for uh, the scope of this, of this topic and this field and where some of the, uh, the current thinking is and where, where perhaps future uh, advances will come from. So I, I'll just begin by um, saying that I actually checked out these uh, suggested uh, readings um, and websites that were given to you. I think they're fantastic. I think they're actually very, very good. There's uh, a wide range of topics that are covered there in a very um, uh, thorough way, although also a, a simple and understandable way, I think. And uh, it's a broader range of topics than we could ever address with you in the you know, just under two hours that we have tonight. So I would encourage you to, to, to look at these sites and uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, learn something from them. Um, so Let's, let's, let's begin. Um, I think that the thing that everyone knows um, uh, from various sources, life experiences, uh, uh, experiences of friends, relatives perhaps, even personal experiences, cancer is really a disease of excessive cell division. Now, there are safeguards that are built into normal cells to ensure that they don't divide. Um, when they shouldn't. And so some things are uh, required for a normal cell to undertake division. And uh, there are systems that check, for example, whether the DNA is fully replicated. Is there any damage to the DNA in the chromosomes? Are there enough nutrients to support uh, growth and cell division? Um, and if these checks fail, uh, normal cells will stop dividing until the conditions are corrected. But cancer cells don't obey these rules. They just continue to grow and divide. Now, um, there are normal signaling processes that um, are ongoing um, in the body that regulate cell division. Most cells in the body are not actually actively dividing, um, but they carry out their, their functions uh, as parts of organs and tissues that help us to do the things that we need to do to, to see, to move, to to uh, uh, maintain um, our, our existence. Now, uh, cells then do divide, however, and they, uh, when they 
uh, receive certain signals. And these uh, signals can come in the form of, of hormones that are present in the blood, steroid hormones, for example, or of proteins, um, protein signals that uh, stimulate them to divide. Um, and cells, normal cells, that is, stop dividing uh, for a number of reasons, and that is a lack, a lack of these signals. Um, a very important um, feature of normal cell behavior is that when uh, cells grow to a certain point so that they encounter other cells, they make contact with other cells, then they're inhibited from growing further. This is called contact inhibition, and it's very important um, in, uh, in, in a normal cell's behavior. Um, and also, many cells seem to have a pre-programmed limit um, uh, on the number of times that they can divide. So after they divide a certain number of times, they senesce, and they, and they cease dividing. Now, in cancer, uh, there is a violation of some of these normal behaviors um, and these normal checks on cell division. Uh, but the way that cancer arises is progressive, um, uh, most often. Uh, in general, there seems to be a transition from a normal healthy cell to eventually a cancer cell. And uh, this is due to uh, an accumulation of genetic changes in normal cells. And these genetic changes hit genes, they affect genes that are termed oncogenes on the one hand, or tumor suppressors on the other hand. And so um, I'll discuss oncogenes and tumor suppressors um, a little bit later in a more specific context. But in general, um, you could think of an oncogene, um, uh, and I'll use the analogy of an automobile here. You can think of an oncogene as uh, analogous to the, uh, the fuel system in the car if it's inappropriately um, activated. So if somehow gas flows to the engine, um, even though you're not stepping on the pedal, um, uh, that would be analogous to activation or formation of an oncogene. Now, a tumor suppressor um, is different. Uh, a tumor suppressor is more like the braking system, okay? So a tumor suppressor, um, when it's present and active, keeps cells from dividing abnormally. And so um, you can see that um, formation of an oncogene, and these oncogenes usually come from normal genes in the cell, which would not uh, be considered oncogenes unless they're altered in some way, genetically. Uh, so if you alter a normal gene and cause it to become an oncogene, um, that can be one contributing uh, genetic factor to tumor formation. And on the other hand, loss of function of tumor suppressors, um, just knock them out, uh, is another, can be another contributing factor to tumor formation. Now, um, basically, all these cancers have to overcome um, or escape from a similar set of regulatory functions in order to grow and to progress. But in different tissues, um, the genes involved may differ. And so this is another real, really uh, another truism about cancer biology. Cancer is not one disease, it's many diseases. Um, and this, this, these, these differences in different types of cancers um, are exactly what makes it difficult to diagnose and to treat all the many different types of cancers that are seen in patients. Um, another uh, point uh, that uh, I will also touch on um, a bit later in a more specific context is that it's possible to inherit um, dysfunctional genes that can lead to development of a particular uh, cancer type. Um, and these are familial cancers. There are, there are people carrying um, certain genetic alterations that predispose them to a very high incidence of cancer, much higher than in the population at large. Um, and so I'll, I'll be mentioning um, some examples of that. Now, um, that's by way of sort of a very general description of some of the features of, of cancer. Um, I'd like to now just mention some of the approaches to cancer therapy. Um, uh, sort of as a roadmap to where I'm going to be spending some time, uh, uh, most of my time uh, this evening uh, in this lecture. And of course, you, you all know, uh, as we heard from Sherry, that surgery um, is uh, one of the 
first lines of, of, uh, of treatment uh, for cancer. Um, radiation is also used, uh, uh, focused radiation um, uh, to kill uh, cells within a tumor or cells that uh, might perhaps escape um, uh, the surgeon's knife. There are, in certain types of cancers, hormonal therapies that are very useful. And so, for example, um, in, in breast cancer uh, and in prostate cancer, hormonal therapies are, are very commonly used. Um, antibody therapies, and we're going to hear, I think, quite a lot more about antibody therapies in the second part of tonight's, um, uh, tonight's lecture. Uh, from, from Ron, who's actually pioneered the, the use of antibodies in therapies of cancer. Um, uh, chemotherapy um, is another, another uh, therapeutic approach. And the idea with chemotherapy, as is really true for, for radiation, is that you want to kill um, uh, the cancer cells and you um, administer um, a compound, a drug, that is generally cytotoxic. It kills growing cells. Um, and these kinds of compounds, these drugs, also affect normal cells. Um, and so the effectiveness of chemotherapy depends on a differential effect on the cancer cells as opposed to normal cells. Um, and of course, because there are effects on normal cells, there are also many, many side effects, um, uh, depending on exactly what uh, what the chemotherapy is. Um, and I'd like to contrast uh, chemotherapy with more targeted therapies, um, which um, are really the frontier, I would say, in, in oncology. And actually, I would include antibody therapies as targeted therapies, in a sense, because they attack antibody therapies, as you'll hear, attack um, specific uh, mechanisms and pathways. But the general idea uh, behind a targeted therapy is that it attacks a cancer-specific process uh, as opposed to processes that are common uh, to all cells. And in principle, anyway, this should reduce the toxicity and the side effects. Um, however, I think one of the early um, issues that arises in targeted therapies is that sometimes um, uh, one one form of attack on, on a cancer isn't sufficient. Cancers are, 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 are wily entities, and they find ways to, to escape um, uh, uh, these, these kinds of, uh, of single therapies. Um, and resistance also can arise. If you're using a, a single agent to attack a cancer, um, let's say you have an inhibitor for a particular enzyme or protein in a cell that is uh, critical to that cancer cell's growth, um, then if the cancer can develop um, a mutation, um, or, if, or if there is a mutation present in some of the many, many cells of the tumor at the time of treatment, then the drug can actually um, kill most of the cells but not affect the cells that have that mutation. And in this way, then, um, that, and those cells that are resistant can continue to grow, and in this way, resistance to the therapy can arise. Um, okay, so I, I did want to say that, uh, however, that targeted therapies um, really are, I think, the frontier because um, of the potential to treat cancers uh, with reduced toxicity, reduced side effects, and to tailor treatments to a specific tumor type, and even within a, a specific tumor type, to, um, uh, to cancers that um, have arisen due to the activation of a particular mechanism. So even within the same tumor type, there's heterogeneity. There can be different tumor types. And so with targeted therapies, it should be possible to tailor the therapy to the patient and to the cancer, um, and even to the subtype of cancer. Um, and it may be necessary, of course, to combine different kinds of targeted therapies in the future, or even perhaps targeted therapies with chemotherapies. But um, I think that um, 10, 20 years from now, perhaps, we'll have a whole arsenal of targeted therapies at our disposal, um, which will make cancer treatment in general, um, I think, much more effective. I think oncology is just on the threshold of a, of a real sort of explosion in, in effectiveness. Um, well, what processes uh, is, uh, do you attack, then, with these targeted therapies? That's, that's, that's the question. And there are many, many um, processes that um, are critical to cancer growth and that could um, form the focus of an attack. Um, what 
What I'm going to discuss tonight or focus on are pathways that play an important role in development. Um, and that's in part, of course, because of my research orientation and my training and, and the kinds of things I work on. But also, if you think about it for a minute, um, an embryo um, grows from a single cell through multiple rounds of division, um, giving rise ultimately to an individual with all these uh, beautifully formed, fully formed organ systems, appendages, structures, et cetera. Um, and so embryonic development is really an exercise in cell proliferation. Now, it's very highly ordered cell proliferation, different from cancer, distinct from cancer. But nevertheless, proliferation is an integral part of this. And in tonight's discussion, we're going to focus on, on the hedgehog signaling pathway, which plays a really critical role in shaping all these structures. Well, maybe not all, but a lot of them anyway. Um, and so uh, hedgehog, the hedgehog protein signal, and other signals like it are the substances within, um, within the embryo that help the embryo to, to, to be organized in its development. Where's that name come from? What is hedgehog, um, and, and why is there a signaling pathway named after it? Well, it turns out that hedgehog, the hedgehog gene was named after its mutant effect in a Drosophila larva, a maggot, essentially. And what you see here is a normal um, larva, a first instar larva. Uh, and these uh, bright areas that you see here in this, in this uh, microscopy, in this dark field mi uh, micrograph, are bristles that are on the bottom side of the fly. And they're the tread that the larva uses as it climbs through the goop, through the fermenting fruit that it eats. Um, and what happens in the hedgehog mutant is that the naked cuticle that's normally uh, sitting between these bristles, between these, these sort of areas of tread, um, if you will, uh, this naked cuticle is gone. And so you have a continuous lawn of these denticles, of these bristles, looking a bit like a hedgehog. And so that's why it was called hedgehog, it's named after the mutant. And that's a common, uh, a common theme um, that you see in organisms where genetic studies are, are, are carried out. You name them after the mutant phenotype quite often. Um, well, so that's the defective, uh, that's the defective embryo, the, the mutant, um, and that's where the name comes from. And actually, uh, we have to infer from that mutant phenotype what the protein actually does. And what it actually does is to signal um, uh, uh, from from one cell to another to cause proper development of pattern in this first instar larva. And here you see stained in green uh, the expression of the hedgehog protein. And it's in a stripe of cells in every segment. The red is another very important signaling protein called wingless, which actually um, does very many similar things uh, to what hedgehog does. And I could have organized my talk this evening um, around the, the Wnt signaling pathway, which is, uh, again, the red protein here. But we're going to talk about hedgehog. And so hedgehog is an embryonic signaling protein important in patterning. And let me just try to simplify this a little bit and, um, so that um, uh, we can uh, really understand this point. In general, hedgehog is expressed in a specific uh, group of cells or a specific tissue or structure in an early embryo. Um, and it's just schematically shown here in red. And so it's produced, that the protein is produced in this red cell. And then um, it moves uh, to the surrounding cells and influences their differentiation. Um, what kind of cell um, will, will they, what kind of cells will these surrounding cells become? And what these cells do is they respond to the level of hedgehog protein that they experience. And they take on different fates according to the level that they, that they see. So the hedgehog protein really guides the development of surrounding cells. Um, and so uh, this is very important in hedgehog activity, is to specify cell fate. But another very important aspect of hedgehog activity is to cause cells to proliferate. And I'm going to illustrate that for you in a minute. Um, and then, of course, if you lose signaling, you'll, you'll get birth defects. And I've shown you the the fly with birth defects I'll also illustrate um, real human birth defects that come from loss of hedgehog signaling. After embryogenesis, um, there are other roles 
for the hedgehog signaling pathway um, in what I like to refer to as pattern maintenance, pr preservation of the tissues. Um, and so this happens uh, through activities that hedgehog signaling has in injury repair and regeneration. And this relates to hedgehog ac activities in tissue stem cells. You're going to have some lectures on stem cells toward the end of the course, I think, and I'm not going to say too much about it tonight, um, although I will discuss uh, stem cells a bit at the end of my part of this uh, lecture. Um, uh, and when, these, uh, when this pathway becomes activated inappropriately, post-embryonically, then this can lead to cancer. Okay, but let me illustrate first the embryonic activities um, of hedgehog in vertebrate or human um, uh, embryos. And let me first show you an experimental organism. Now, uh, because I'm showing you an embryo here, actually this is not too much different from the way that a human embryo looks, okay? But it is a chick embryo, a bird embryo. And hedgehog is expressed in these midline structures. We may need to kill the lights a little bit uh, or, or, or turn them down a bit. Um, and it's stained for here in brown, and it's expressed in these midline structures that course um, through the embryo all the way from the head to the tail, uh, called the floor plate of the neural tube and the notochord. Um, and what you see here is a normal chick embryo um, in which the normal structures of the face and the brain are present, including this nice big dome-shaped forebrain. These bulges on the side are the optic vesicles that will form the structures of the eye. And then these bulges here in the front will form the, the structures of the face, They're the facial processes. These little portions here, the, the asterisk portion, uh, will actually form a nostril. And of course, there's one on each side. And now, what you see in these other embryos here are what happens if you treat these, these uh, chick embryos with a compound, a drug called cyclopamine. It comes from a plant. I'll say a lot more about it later. Suffice it right now to say that it blocks hedgehog signaling. It completely blocks, well, it can in some cases. These are just partial disruptions of hedgehog signaling. Here is a pretty nearly complete disruption of hedgehog signaling. And what you see is that there is a loss of these midline structures that normally develop until, in this case, you have a single optic vesicle, in the most severe case, a single optic vesicle in the midline that will give rise to a cyclopic eye. And the nasal structures develop as a proboscis-like structure with a single nostril at the tip. And this is also seen in humans. So this is cyclopia um, in, 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 a, in an infant um, who didn't live long. But you can see here the cyclopic eye in the middle of the face, and then immediately above it, the remnants of the nasal structures developing as a proboscis with a single nostril. And that's because these nasal structures have been displaced upward by the midline optic vesicle, OK? These are milder forms of this syndrome, which is called holoprosencephaly, OK? And I'll tell you why in a minute. But what you can see here is that there's a single nostril here in the nose, but the eyes are now separate, although still very close set. In this infant, there are uh, some malformations of the midline. The eyes are also very close set. This gentleman here has a single upper midline incisor, which is a very mild form of holoprosencephaly. And the reason it's called holoprosencephaly is because the brain is abnormal. So especially in these severely affected individuals, what you see if you look internally at the brain anatomy is that there is not the normal subdivision into the lobes of the cortex and so forth. The entire forebrain, or prosencephalon, which is the term for the forebrain, develops as a single undivided sphere, hence holoprosencephaly. And here you see a section through an individual with uh, holoprosencephaly. And the facial features of this individual should be, would be quite severe, very much like, like this person here. So when you lose hedgehog signaling, you lose midline structures. You lose um, a lot of information. And uh, you, you get these very severe birth defects. Um, many, many structures actually fail to develop properly in the embryo. And this is just one of the more striking examples. I want to show you one other example. Well, actually, let me just um, show you here with this, with this schematic diagram how at the early stage of development of the nervous system, at this stage, it's just a plate that's beginning to fold up, to curl up, fold up and make a tube. And that tube 
will form the brain at the, at, at the uh, head end, and it will form the spinal cord um, along the rest of the body. Um, so this is an early stage. And just beneath this plate, this flat sheet of cells, there's a structure called the precordal plate. And it's in that structure that hedgehog is expressed. And that's the structure that you saw stained in the chick embryo. And this expression of hedgehog, and this is now a side view at a later stage when the neural tube has closed to form the brain um, and the spinal cord. Hedgehog expression here in the midline is required to form the proper structures of the forebrain. I just want to give you one more example of how hedgehog functions in normal development. Um, and this is a very famous example in developmental biology. Um, it's uh, again, using the chick as a model system. And what's done in this experiment here is to graft a piece of tissue. Now, you, this, is, uh, this is actually, uh, we're, we're focusing in here on the part of the embryo that will form the limb. So it's just a bulge. This is called the limb bud. And it's going to grow out in, in time and form all the structures of, of the appendage. So if at this very early stage, when it looks basically just like a paddle, you take a little magical piece of tissue, and it really matters where you get this tissue. It has to be from the posterior. And you graft it to the anterior of another limb bud. What you see, um, instead of the normal pattern of digits, this is a chick wing, really. It's a, the anterior limb, so this looks like a chicken wing, right? That's what it is. Um, if you engraft this piece of tissue to the anterior, you get a duplication of these digits. So instead of the normal two, three, four, you see four, three, two, two, three, four. Well, what is it that's so special about this posterior piece of tissue? If you take the piece of tissue from the anterior, nothing happens. You just get normal development. What is special about this is that there is expression here of the sonic hedgehog gene, one of the genes um, in this family of signaling proteins. And you can actually produce this same effect just by taking a bead um, of synthetic material and soaking it in the hedgehog protein. And just that bead soaked in protein alone suffices to produce this duplication. So hedgehog is causing um, the cells of this developing limb bud to proliferate wildly, because you're forming a whole second structure, and to proliferate in a way that forms these, these pattern elements, these digits, in, in the developing limb. So it's patterning. But it's also proliferation. And I, I really want to make sure that I emphasize proliferation, because um, that's uh, an aspect that's very important in cancer. So um, now uh, I need to just briefly tell you uh, a little bit about the hedgehog signaling pathway and how it works. I'm going to just keep this very simple and introduce uh, a minimum number of components, OK? So you, you won't have to remember very much. Um, when there is no hedgehog protein around, cells are, are quiet. They're not, this pathway is not active. And that's because a protein called patched, sitting here in the membrane of the cell, is inhibiting the action of another protein called smoothen, which also sits in the membrane of the cell. OK. Now, when hedgehog is present, um, coming from another cell, and actually there, there's some fancy tricks that hedgehog gets up to. When it's made, it gets modified with some lipids, um, which cholesterol is one, actually, kind of interesting. Palmitate is the other. And that causes it to remain tightly associated with the surface of cells that produce it. And so it requires a special protein for its release. Um, the important thing, however, is that it's released, and then it can encounter the cell that's going to receive the signal. And the way it acts is that hedgehog binds to patched. And now patch no longer can block smoothened activity. So binding of hedgehog blocks patched inhibition of smoothen. Now smoothen can fire a signal to the inside of the cell. And it does so via these proteins called the glee proteins, which are transcription factors. That means that they enter the nucleus and affect the expression of genes um, in the chromosomes um, within the nucleus. So that's how this works. In the absence of hedgehog, patched inhibits smoothen. When hedgehog is present, it binds to patched and blocks its inhibition of smoothen so that smoothen can then activate the pathway via the glee transcription factors. 
Um, I'll skip this. This just shows that various mouse mutants in these components also produce holoprosencephaly, just like I showed you with cyclopamine. Now, let's talk about the hedgehog pathway in cancer, because this is really our subject tonight. And uh, what happens, um, and the way that this was uncovered, was because there were some patients um, running around uh, with a syndrome called Gorlin syndrome. And what Gorlin syndrome is, is a mutation in the gene for patched. Now, you all know that there are um, two chromosomes of each type, right? And so these Gorlin syndrome patients just have patch mutated in one of those chromosomes. So there is a remaining active form of the gene, of the patch gene. And that works out OK, because one copy is about enough to keep smooth and regulated. Mind you, these people have foreheads that are a little bit broader. Their eyes are a little bit wider apart, sort of anti-cyclopia, if you will. And there are some other features that are a little bit unusual. But they're basically fine. They develop fine. Um, they function fine. The only problem is they are subject to um, a very high incidence of certain kinds of cancer. And so what happens is that the remaining good copy of the patch gene gets knocked out, especially if this person gets a lot of sun. And so on the sun-exposed surfaces of somebody with this syndrome, with Gorlin syndrome, you can see many, many lesions. These are all basal cell carcinomas, a type of skin cancer. And uh, so people with Gorlin syndrome, without fail, all get basal cell carcinoma, and usually a large number of basal cell carcinomas. Now, basal cell carcinoma is usually not such a serious cancer. It's handled uh, by the dermatologist in the office, usually. Um, and, uh, however, in these patients, because there's so much of it, it can be a real challenge. And in some cases, as I'll show you a little bit later, basal cell carcinoma can become highly invasive locally or even metastasize. That means it can move to other, other, other organs and tissues and, and become a very serious problem. So that's basal cell carcinoma. There's another kind of cancer, and this is a childhood brain tumor. This is a terrible, terrible disease. Medulloblastoma, it's called. Um, and it originates in the cerebellum. Uh, there happens to be a role for the hedgehog pathway in the developing cerebellum. It stimulates proliferation of certain uh, neuronal uh, precursor types in the cerebellum. And so when you knock out patched and the pathway becomes active, uh, this process uh, goes to its extreme form. Um, uh, and so you have occurring in these patients um, uh, cerebellar tumors. This happens to be a mouse model of this. Um, and here you can see the tumor overgrowing the normal structures of the cerebellum. And the blue color tells you that the hedgehog pathway is highly, highly active in these, in these mice. Okay? And so a heterozygote is one hit away from having this pathway fully active. And if that hit happens in the right cell, bingo, there's cancer. Um, it, there can be skin cancer. Um, a brain cancer. There are a few other types of cancers. Um, and hedgehog can also contribute in other ways to, to uh, other types of cancer growth. So patched really is like the brakes, right, um, on this process. So in the automobile analogy that I used earlier, uh, patched is the, is the tumor suppressor. You lose patched, you get a tumor if it happens in the right cell. Well, we also have examples of, uh, of uh, inappropriate um, activation of, uh, 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 or, or delivery of fuel to this cell cycle uh, and, and to, to proliferation. And that comes from um, a, a mutation that affects smoothen. Now, remember, smoothen is normally inhibited by patched. But if you mutate it just right, if you hit it in a certain part and you change a particular residue, Actually, there are a number of residues that you can affect in this way. Um, but if you hit it just right, then smoothen is no longer sensitive to inhibition by patched. And so it turns the pathway on, and the pathway is full on, um, even though patched is still present and there is no hedgehog present. Actually, both of these are equivalent to having hedgehog present. If you have no patched, smoothen fires. If smoothened um, becomes activated, then it doesn't need hedgehog present either. Okay? But this then is an oncogene. 
This is a cellular gene that, through a very specific mutation, has um, become activated in a way that can no longer be regulated. And again, if this event happens in the right cell, bingo, you've got a tumor or a cancer. Now, uh, this uh, patch mutation can be transmitted in a familial uh, fashion because um, people carrying a single mutation are largely normal, although they do get a lot of basal cell carcinoma and so forth, but um, it's compatible with life and with reproduction. And so this is an example of a familial cancer predisposition, Gorlin syndrome, loss of a single patch gene. Um, activation of smoothen through this kind of a hit, uh, making it an oncogene, cannot be transmitted. Can anybody think of a reason why? Well, um, the reason is actually that if you have this pathway active in all the cells of an embryo, as you would if you transmitted this you know, through the germline, that embryo would develop very, very badly, would be very disorganized, and would never be viable. Okay? So this is an example of a, a, sporadic, a sporadically arising cancer, a somatic tumor. Somatic meaning that it's arising in the cells of the body as opposed to the germ cells. Um, OK, well now, let me uh, move away from these little sort of sterile diagrams and show you a picture of a very nice uh, plant. Uh, the corn lily grows in high mountain meadows, um, about 4,000 feet and up. Very beautiful in flower, um, but actually it has a deadly effect when, uh, when it's consumed by pregnant animals. And this is what happened in the 50s. Um, there were a group of, uh, of Basque sheep herders in Idaho, uh, and they were pasturing their flocks at higher altitudes because there had been a drop. Uh, and so when they took their flocks to higher altitudes, they experienced outbreaks of cyclopia, like you see here. Here's the cyclopic eye. This is a lamb, a cyclopic lamb, that was born to uh, um, a pregnant ewe that consumed this plant during gestation. And here you see the proboscis with the single nostril at the tip. And these sheep herders took their problem to a branch of the United States Department of Agriculture in nearby Utah, Logan, Utah. And here we see uh, a gentleman who then went, uh, went up into the mountains with a flock of sheep, fed them various plants until he figured out which one it was. Um, and this gentleman here is, uh, uh, this is Lynn James, Dick Keeler, a chemist. Um, determined which compound was responsible for this and identified it, and this is it, it's cyclopamine. This is the compound that um, inhibits the hedgehog pathway. But of course, when, when this compound was identified um, in, actually in 1968, this paper was published, um, people had no idea what it, why it was doing this or how it was affecting development to produce cyclopia. And it wasn't until many, many years later, um, actually in 1996, when we knocked out the sonic hedgehog gene in the mouse, that we realized that this, was, this, this compound was actually causing a very good mimic of the loss of that, um, uh, of that gene and of that signaling pathway. And so um, what I'll show you now is the way in which cyclopamine and compounds like it affect normal uh, development and you've already seen that, right? The, uh, you get cyclopia. Um, but in the setting of cancer, cyclopamine, which blocks the hedgehog pathway, um, could be very helpful. And here you see an experiment in which we used uh, a medulloblastoma from that model, from that animal model. And I, I meant to mention, um, and I will now, that uh, this discovery that uh, Gorlin syndrome is caused by mutation of patch was actually made by another professor here at Stanford, um, uh, Matt Scott, who's also in the developmental biology department. Anyway, um, when you have a tumor like this, if you treat the animal carrying that tumor with cyclopamine, um, and actually this is a graph on the flank of the animal so we can more easily follow it, you see that the tumor regresses, whereas a control tumor um, just continues to grow and gets very large. Well, it turns out that um, cyclopamine is just the first of many compounds that have been found. And we did some of this uh, looking at large libraries of synthetic 
um, drugs, uh, small molecules that could be drugs, I should say, um, uh, to look for other compounds that block the signaling pathway. And it turns out that they all act, um, uh, most anyway, act in the same way that cyclopamine does, by binding to smoothened. Um, and I won't go into the details of how we came to learn that, but that is the mechanism of cyclopamine action. It binds to smoothened and causes it to be inactive. Doesn't matter if patched is present, um, doesn't matter if the hedgehog signal is present, Cyclopamine binds to smoothen and locks it up so that it can't fire the signal to the inside of the cell that I mentioned earlier. Um, okay, so um, I've told you that uh, now that uh, cyclopamine uh, antagonizes the hedgehog pathway by binding to smoothen and that it's effective in a mouse model of medulloblastoma. This pathway has a primary role in tumor cells um, in medulloblastoma, basal cell carcinoma, um, Ewing sarcoma, and in some hematologic malignancies, we think, some, some, some uh, diseases of the blood. Um, uh, but pathway activity is also important in other cells, not the primary cells of the tumor, but cells that are called stromal cells, which surround the tumor and support its growth. And so um, this is actually probably a broader range of diseases than those um, cancers in which hedgehog is primarily active. Either way, um, a blockade of the hedgehog pathway could be beneficial in cancer treatment. Now, many pharmaceutical companies are actually pursuing anti-hedgehog drug programs because it's actually relatively easy to find cyclopamine mimics. And so one, one, one sort of fact of, of uh, drug development is that Companies really, I mean, com companies have a bottom line. They have to make money. Um, they like to discover and, and develop and market drugs um, that they control, that they have uh, intellectual property um, for uh, patents. Um, and so it's relatively easy to find small molecules. And I illustrated that in the previous slide by showing you all of these small molecules that we found actually with a rather modest effort. Um, and companies, of course, have great resources that they can bring to bear on these problems. And every company has a proprietary set of compounds that they can screen. They've done so. And I can name right now 10 pharmaceutical or biotechnology companies that have anti-hedgehog um, drug programs, which are intended uh, to use to treat in cancer. And I just want to show you um, some of the early trials in humans. There's a question here. Drug that's anti hedgehog, what are the side effects of that then? Yeah, very good question. And so, um, obviously, in early development in gestation, the effects are horrific. Um, it turns out that in adults, the effects are not so bad. In fact, uh, there's some hair loss. Um, there may be some other effects. There may be some long term effects, which we'll have to learn about in the future. But as I'm about to show you here, um, in an individual with locally advanced basal cell carcinoma, what you see is that there's a dramatic regression of the tumor here. This is another individual um, where the basal cell carcinoma has become uh, a real problem because it's about to um, affect, affect the eye. Um, uh, and so there's a very good effect here as well. And now I'll show you um, an individual with medulloblastoma, which was treated surgically to remove the tumor, then with radiation, and then with chemotherapy. And despite all of these treatments, um, this tumor became metastatic. That, that is, it invaded, it, uh, it, it moved and invaded other tissues. And here you see mostly bony sites, actually. And here you see um, uh, medulloblastoma cells in an imaging method, which reveals cells that are highly metabolically active. This is called PET scanning. And you're going to hear more about this as well. In, in, in actually the next, the next meeting of the course. Um, and so all these highly metabolically active sites are places where the tumor has taken up residence and is growing. And this is very painful because bony metastases are, are really very, very painful. After a month, actually two months of treatment with this hedgehog antagonist, um, which actually is developed by Genentech, a name that many of you will, will know, um, in, in partnership with a smaller company that took the first steps in developing this drug. After two months of treatment, this 
this has wiped out, um, uh, apparently, all the sites of metastasis, what you see here, the bladder, the kidneys, and the heart are all sites of high metabolic activity or a concentration um, of, of this, this drug that's used to, to image metabolic activity. Um, and so the tumor has almost completely regressed. However, one month later, it's returned in many, many places. And that's due to the occurrence of a mutation in smoothened that has rendered smoothened resistant to the drug. So the cancer returned, and this individual died shortly thereafter. But this is very, very promising. And um, this individual was treated with so many different uh, 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 forms of treatment that could conceivably have caused the tumor to change, caused genetic changes. And these undoubtedly contributed, contributed to um, the resistance that arose eventually. OK, this question here. The question was, um, was this person born with the mutation that caused it to escape? No. That mutation arose within cells of the tumor and is not in the germline of the individual or in any of the other somatic tissues. And the mere fact that this patient was treated with this drug probably selected for the cells that have this resistance mutation, which, as I said, affects smooth. OK, so cyclopamine derivatives of improved potency are being developed. There's a company that's specifically developing cyclopamine. Um, as I mentioned, most pharmaceutical companies have a hedgehog project going. Um, one question that we became interested in is whether any FDA-approved drugs currently in use might show some activity in antagonizing the hedgehog pathway. And we considered this because it's really so easy to find antagonists. So with all the drugs out there that have been approved for human use, surely there might be a few that are already approved and might have anti-hedgehog activity. And these could be useful in bringing therapy to patients more rapidly. Even though I showed you those, those, those patients that have been treated with this drug, that's a phase one trial. And they're still, we're still at least a few years away from a common use of these, of these drugs in, uh, in, in therapy. And actually, we found two drugs. One of them is itraconazole, which is a commonly used antifungal drug. And the other is arsenic trioxide, which is actually very effective um, in a specific leukemia, promyelocytic leukemia. Um, and these both inhibit the hedgehog pathway. And I'll show you some data from a mouse model. This is the mouse flank model of medulloblastoma, where you take a tumor that arose in a patched mutant mouse, um, a cerebellar tumor, and you engraft it into the flank of the mouse. And with a control treatment, you see the tumor gets very large. And then these are increasing um, uh, uh, levels of arsenic that are given on a daily basis, uh, uh, arsenic trioxide, which is actually very well tolerated in, in human patients. Um, uh, and these mice actually do much better. Here you see the highest dose. And if you look at the curves here, this is completely blocked growth of that tumor. And this is a similar experiment, not showing pictures of the mice, but with itraconazole, where again, itraconazole, and one of these curves is actually in combination with cyclopamine. You just, um, but itraconazole on its own is well able to control the growth of this tumor. And now this is a uh, uh, treatment with itraconazole of basal cell carcinoma in a mouse model of, uh, of basal cell carcinoma, where you can see the tumor growth. And this is work that was done with Irv Epstein um, and Jean Tang um, here at Stanford. Uh, Jean is uh, Irv's, Irv's at, uh, uh, in Oakland. Um, and you can see that the tumor growth is really dramatically inhibited, whereas the control continues to grow. And uh, this may not mean a lot to many of you, but these are cells of the tumor, um, very nice, sort of nice looking cells. But when you treat with itraconazole, they undergo necrosis, apoptosis, uh, probably, and, and necrosis, which is what you see here. And so that's the effect of itraconazole. So these are both approved for human use. Um, like cyclopamine, itraconazole appears to act on smoothened. But arsenic appears to act on the GLEE proteins. Remember, these are the transcription factors that, when the pathway is activated, enter the nucleus and activate target genes um, on, in the chromosomes there. And so what might be the possible advantages of these already approved drugs? Well, one obvious one is that, conceivably, trials in human patients with these kinds of cancers could begin very soon. Um, uh, and they're already approved. And the levels of these drugs um, that are needed to produce these effects in the mouse, the serum levels are very similar, actually, to the levels 
that are achieved in patients that are, being, uh, that are undergoing these therapies. Well, one advantage actually is that that smoothened mutation that I, I showed you, it's shown here in red, that the mutant is resistant to treatment with that drug from Genentech. So the pathway stays on. Um, this is normal smoothened. The pathway is very well suppressed, dropping down here. Well, and what you can see here is that when you treat with arsenic trioxide, um, the resistant form of smoothened and the normal form of smoothened are both inhibited equally. And so maybe arsenic would be a way to get around the resistance that I described. And then this is a little complicated. I'm not going to describe it. I'll just tell you the idea here, which is that if you combine these two compounds, one acting at the level of smoothened and one acting at the level of glee, the combined effect is much more potent. And you can get a potent effect at lower levels of these drugs at least in cultured cells. And so uh, this remains to be tested um, in animals. But the idea is that perhaps you could combine the use of these two approved drugs and get a very potent effect in these tumor types. Well, now, I'd be remiss if I didn't discuss one other aspect of, uh, well, are, are there questions? I'll, I'll be happy to take a few questions now, I guess. Go ahead. It's really basic, and I probably should have caught this at the beginning, but are the hedgehog pathways in every cell but they only get activated by the protein that comes from the embryonic cell? Um, many cells, not all, but many cells um, uh, in, certainly in the embryo, almost all cells, can respond to the hedgehog signal. In the adult, post-embryonically, many cells are potentially responsive. But yes, uh, the absence of hedgehog signal um, uh, prevents them from activating the pathway. But the pathway is in every kind of cell. The capacity to respond to a hedgehog signal is in many different kinds of cells. Not necessarily all. Another question. Do they have any other role besides signaling this one? The hedgehog, or do they have any role in the normal cell, normal adult cells? Well, um, in adult cells, uh, are there roles for the hedgehog pathway in adult cells? Well, one role um, is is that they're, they're, um, the hedgehog signaling pathway appears to be part of a response to injury. So if you damage a tissue in various ways, um, the hedgehog pathway seems to be involved in mounting an appropriate response to injury. Okay, so that's one role. There may be others. Um, now, I want to say a bit about stem cells, uh, even though you're going to hear a lot more about this later. Basically, these are tissue stem cells that I'm talking about. Not embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells have the capacity to become all sorts of different uh, types of, uh, of cells and contribute to different types of organs. I'm referring here to tissue stem cells, which reside within specific organs of the body. In the skin, for example, there are stem cells that reside in this bulge region of the hair follicle. In the intestine, there are these stem cells that are found in the base of the crypts that form the lining of, of, the, uh, of the intestinal epithelium of the lining. And in, in, uh, in the blood system, uh, stem cells are, are found in the, in the bone marrow. Okay? And each of these different kinds of stem cells is organ restricted. It doesn't generally have the potential to become, uh, to contribute to a different type of organ. Um, and one of the ideas that is uh, really uh, very interesting and uh, still really very experimental in nature, but I think is, is, is a very interesting future direction, is that cancers may arise from these tissue stem cells. Why is that an interesting idea? Well, uh, it turns out that these tissue stem cells are present within a particular organ or tissue throughout the life of the individual, and they continually self-renew. Not very actively, but they're always there, and they always replenish themselves. And what's important about that is that then they can give rise to other cells that will differentiate and form uh, the, the cells that actually do the work of the organ. For example, in the intestine, the absorptive cells that help to absorb nutrients. Um, uh, and so there are stem cells that have this capacity to self-renew. They give rise to these transit amplifying cells, which are no longer stem cells because they can't self-renew, but they are able to proliferate quite a lot and give rise ultimately to differentiated cells, 
which are no longer able to proliferate at all. So that's how things work. And what may happen in cancer is that these stem or progenitor cells, so this is just the normal uh, uh, situation here, um, they might acquire uh, mutations that make them no longer require the signals from their niche, from the normal place where they reside. And there are signals that are present there and that help these stem cells to maintain this capacity to self-renew. Well, if mutations um, allow these stem cells to become independent of this location, of this niche, then uh, they no longer need those signals. Um, they might proliferate and leave the niche. Or mutations like these could also affect these progenitor cells, these transit amplifying cells, so that they also could um, expand and, and leave their normal locations or become uh, a little bit more active. And then with other additional mutations, and remember that the genetics of cancer is, is progressive. There are many changes that must occur. With additional mutations that ramp up the rate of proliferation, these stem cells that are niche independent now, that can leave home, would be able to grow more rapidly and produce a full-blown tumor. And the reason that this is attractive is that stem cells, as I said, um, are already have this property of self-renewal, infinite self-renewal. They're not very fast at it, but they can do it forever. Um, and another thing about stem cells is because they're hanging out um, in a particular tissue for the entire life of the individual, there's a great opportunity for them to accumulate additional mutations that could produce this phenotype. So that's all I'm going to say. Um, uh, I'll, I'll stop here uh, because I think I'm... And this was this is the last uh, the last slide anyway, um, and I'll just uh, leave you with that final uh, idea about origins of cancer, perhaps in stem cells. And so, Ron, I hope you have enough time to. <laughs> Why don't we have Dr. Beachy take one or two questions if they're burning ones, and then we'll have Dr. Levy come up. There's one over there. Um, yeah, I just have one question on the last point about these tissue stem cells. Is that purely theoretical at this point, or are, is there any evidence from certain patients that like a, a colon tissue cell has been found in a lung tumor? Um, well, in general, uh, th th there is a lot of evidence in support of this hypothesis. And the evidence is that um, if you have a tumor that has arisen in a human patient, you can sort the cells of that tumor based on proteins that are expressed on the surface. Um, so you can divide the cells into different, different groups based on what proteins they, they, put, uh, they put out. Um, and if you do that, what you find is that it's only a subset, generally, generally speaking, a subset of the cells in the tumor that are able to propagate the tumor when you reintroduce those cells into a new host. This would be a mouse now, even if you're starting with a human tumor. You put it into an in, immunocompromised mouse. And those cells that are capable of doing that our cells, and this was first really found in leukemia, um, the cells that are capable of propagating the tumor have surface properties that are very much like hematopoietic stem cells. So they look like stem cells. Um, and so there is some evidence for this. And there is also genetic evidence um, that mutations in pathways that affect stem cell self-renewal um, also affect formation of cancers. Um, and uh, Really, these cancer stem cells, or tumor-initiating cells is another way of, of saying it, um, have been found in many, many different types of tumors, blood tumors, uh, solid tumors. Um, and uh, Stanford really is a major center of this kind of research, a lot of it actually happening at the Stem Cell Institute. People like Michael Clark um, and, and Irv Weissman have, have really uh, pioneered these kinds of studies. You can hear a pin drop in this room, and I don't think it's because you're all asleep. I think it's because he kept you on the edge of your seats. So uh, what I want to do is I want to pick up where we just left off and consider what you need to do. Let's say you discovered cyclopamine, and you think it really might have a good effect on cancer, and you want to try it out in people. What do you have to do? So these are called clinical trials. Uh, that means we do things on people which are experiments. 
and we want to figure out whether they're going to uh, be successful or not. And we have two issues to deal with. One is safety, and the other is efficacy. Is it safe, and does it do any good? So um, these are not absolute terms. These are relative terms. How safe and how efficacious? I guess it depends on what you're trying to treat. So let's say you had an anti-fertility drug. Uh, you better know that's safe. I mean, preventing pregnancy is one thing, but uh, causing birth defects or uh, developmental defects in someone who was born, whose mother got exposed to this <laughs> drug 20 years later, that would be a serious problem, and it takes a long time to prove that it's really that safe. Let's say you want to treat cancer. Uh, cancer in uh, occurring mostly in elderly people. I guess you don't care too much about teratogenicity, what might happen to offspring of that person, because the person isn't capable of having offspring anymore. So the safety issues there are completely different. And the degree of efficacy that you care about is a lot um, different uh, than other situations. So I want to take you through some clinical trials. Some of them occurred here at Stanford. Some of them are occurring today, in fact, here at Stanford, and uh, where we have some indications of safety and efficacy. And we've actually developed some new treatments for cancer. Now, there's a whole series of steps you have to go through uh, if you want to embark on this road of proving safety and efficacy. First, you have to talk to the FDA, uh, the federal government that regulates this kind of activity. You can't just whip up something in your garage and uh, go out and start injecting it into people. Uh, you have to get permission. And in order to get to permission, you have to file what's called an IND, an Investigational New Drug uh, Exemption. It means you're exempt from the usual uh, limitations on doing this because you've convinced the FDA you know how to make the stuff. Uh, you've convinced the FDA that it might be safe because you've checked it out in animals to see that it's safe, to at least a, uh, to a degree. And you've got a design for testing it in a clinical trial that uh, might lead to a conclusion. Uh, you can't just make a conclusion on one person uh, trial. You have to try it in a bunch of people. And you have to compare it to something. You have to see whether it's better. You have to have the statistical power to be able to prove that. And if you can do all that, you get uh, approved for a new drug by the FDA, a new drug application. Uh, this is a process that usually takes about $100 million and 10 years of time. So you don't want to embark on this lightly. But let's say the FDA gave you the permission to try, and you have an IND. I hold a couple of INDs. Uh, and so yet, then you have to go to your Stanford institution and say um, to a committee that sits and, and looks at this plan and decides whether you're subjecting people to too much risk or not, and whether you're in, informing people about the risks and potential benefits, and you're not coercing anybody uh, to join this trial. And so they look at your consent form that you're getting people to sign, and they go over the procedures, the ethical procedures that relate to the, to the degree of risk and to the degree of, of potential benefit. And then if they like that a whole idea, you have to go to a scientific review, review committee, a SRC so-called, and, and convince them that uh, this makes a lot of sense scientifically. It has a good rationale. Um, you heard about some of the uh, development of the drug uh, cyclo uh, cyclopamine and some of the uh, derivatives of that drug. And this makes pretty good sense scientifically. So then you want to do it in the hospital. There's a special place in the hospital where they set aside some beds and some places to work on people. Uh, and that's called the General Clinical Research Center. Uh, and they have a committee that uh, allocates their resources. And they don't only, only have the space or the time for everybody to do this at the same time. They have to figure out uh, who to prioritize their resources for. And then when you've done all that, you have to figure out how to pay the bill. Uh, funding. Um, it takes a lot of money to do this. And uh, sometimes we get the money from the government. Sometimes we get the money from companies that have a stake in the outcome. Uh, sometimes we get the money from people who are uh, interested in the problem and want to donate money to the cause. And so we have uh, a lot of money to raise to be able to do all of this and pay the bill. The insurance companies don't want to pay the bill for something that hasn't been proven to work. Uh, it's only after the FDA approves the new drug that the insurance companies have to pay the bill. 
So if you want to do an x-ray, if you want to do a biopsy, if you want to do a blood test, if you want to do some procedures, they cost a lot of money. Uh, maybe you want to pay somebody's airline ticket to come fly here uh, and put them up in a hotel and pay someone to talk to them and make sure they get to the right place at the right time and the data gets collected and all of that has to happen. It costs a lot of money. Anytime there's money involved, we have this thorny issue here called conflict of interest. If I own the company, of course I want it, the drug to work, um, but I might be a little bit biased in, in interpreting the data, or I might be a little too enthusiastic in talking to the subjects to join the trial. And so I can't simultaneously own the company, own the trial, and also conduct the research on the persons who are going to join. So we have a committee that regulates conflict of interest. And then we have the issue uh, of ethics. I've asked around, uh, there are a lot of people who call themselves ethicists. I've asked around, how do you become an ethicist? <laughs> and it turns out it's, it's a self-declared title. <laughs> and there are a lot of people who have a lot of ideas about what's ethical and what's not. So you have a, a very thorny process to navigate here. It's amazing that anything ever comes out the other end. But it does, because we have a lot of people who are really motivated to make this all happen. There's probably more to talk about in this slide, and maybe more of interest to talk about in this slide, than anything I'm going to show you through the rest of the talk. And we can come back to that if you want. So in clinical trials, we have several phases. And you heard it referred to here. We have phase one. That means we're trying to figure out whether it's safe. Mainly, we're trying to figure out whether it's safe. We're trying to find the right dose, the right schedule. And we're trying to figure out what happens to it when you inject it into the body. Where does it go? Does it come out in the urine? Does it come out in the, in the, in, in the stool? Is it, does it get metabolized by the kidney, by the liver? You know, what's, what's going to happen to this drug in, in the persons? And uh, that's pretty much the idea of the phase one trial. And uh, I have to tell you that every phase one trial is a closet phase two trial. Because even though you're talking about finding out whether it's safe and where it goes and all this stuff, uh, you kind of like to see it work at the same time. You pretend like you're not trying to find that out, but you really want to do uh, notice something good happening. Because then you can motivate the investors and the money to do the phase two trial to pick a dose and pick a schedule and see how often it works and to kind of get a feeling for how often this might make something good happen. It costs a lot more money to do the phase two trial than it does the phase one trial. And if that causes a lot of money, you can imagine what it costs to do a phase three trial that gets you to the FDA approval, so-called pivotal trial, usually randomized. You want to compare it to something that's usually done and you want to see who wins. Is yours any better than the existing treatment uh, that we have that we use today. And here's where ethics come in, because you're going to give a coin flip and you're going to tell people they're going to get this or that treatment uh, based on, the, on the, uh, a random flip of the coin, uh, because you want to make sure that these two groups are equally uh, balanced for all the things you care about. And uh, maybe you'll know, maybe you won't know, maybe the person will know, maybe they won't know. That's called blinding or double blinding, uh, if it makes a difference in figuring out the answer. So maybe you don't want to know who's getting what. So people need to sign up for this. They have to say, I'm willing to take a coin flip to get the new thing that I heard was so exciting in the phase two trial. Had a lot of things happening that were good. And I want to come, and I want to come to Stanford. And I want to get this stuff. And you're going to tell me I'm going to take a flip of the coin, whether I'm going to get this stuff or not? <laughs> now we have ethic. Now we have ethical problems. But it happens. So now I want to, I want to tell you some treatments that, uh, that I'm very interested in. And, um, there are some success stories here, and there are some failures here. Uh, most of these uh, new ideas don't work. At the end of the day, we have very few drugs coming out, or very few new treatments coming out of, the, of this whole process uh, that actually uh, get approved, that actually benefit a lot of people and work. So uh, I like to use uh, ideas about how the, the immune system that normally we're born with that fight off uh, bacteria and viruses and invaders from the outside, infections, can be used to fight the invaders from the inside, the cancers that arise from our, bad, our genes that have gone bad. And maybe we can tune the immune system that uh, maybe wasn't developed to fight cancer. Maybe we can retrain it and focus it on the invaders from the inside. And so there, there are, uh, there's a huge success story here called antibodies. And um, you've heard it referred to. It's one of the targeted therapies that we have for cancer now. And then there are some ideas about vaccines. Uh, not vaccines to prevent cancer. That would be a good idea if we knew who to give them to. But vaccines to 
to teach the immune system to uh, pay more attention to the cancer and go fight against it. So teaching the body's own immune system to fight the cancer, that would be what we call an active immune therapy, uh, tumor vaccines, or uh, making something outside the body and giving it to the person in the form of parts of the immune system, antibodies or immune cells that, that when we give them, they go and fight the cancer and they last for a certain period of time and then they wear out, you have to give it again like a drug. So antibodies are the big success story. So now we want to start uh, the story uh, by presenting you a case. Uh, this is Wendy Harpham, and I have her permission to tell you her story. Uh, Wendy Harpham, uh, when we met her, was a 36-year-old internal medicine physician and a mother of three. In 1990, she developed a lump in her groin, and she had a biopsy, and the diagnosis was lymphoma, a specific kind of cancer of the lymph glands. And she had the usual treatments that we still use today, chemotherapy, uh, and she had a complete response. All the tumors went away. These are the standard treatments that we have for this disease. But uh, two years later, the cancer came back. And then she had radiation treatment uh, to a certain area of her body in the chest area. And that lasted for about a year. That worked for a while. It lasted for about a year. And in 1993, a year later, it came back again. So she heard about a clinical trial of a monoclonal antibody going on at Stanford. And she consulted some East Coast experts. And they recommended going with what was proven, called the people at Stanford Mavericks. You're looking at the maverick. <laughs> so she decided to join the trial. Uh, in 1993, she received, uh, she was one of the first people to receive a new drug, uh, an antibody that we were developing with a company called IDEC Pharmaceuticals in a phase one trial. And she had a partial regression of her tumor. She was one of the first people ever noticed to have something good happen in a phase one trial. Remember, phase one trial, we're only trying to find out whether it's safe. We're not really trying to find out whether it works or not. But people like Wendy Haverin uh, were really important because something good happened. She had a regression of her tumor. It lasted about a year, almost as good as she had with the usual treatments. Uh, but then, by then, we were doing a phase two trial. So she got in on it. She's an early adopter. We talked about early adopters earlier. <laughs> So, you know, early adopters like to try the next thing that's coming along. Well, she came back and she joined the phase two trial. And that time, she had a complete remission of her tumor. It all went away. Uh, and that lasted for about a year. And she got more chemotherapy and she had another remission. And then she had another recurrence. And then she was uh, still able to join a, a, an extended phase two trial by then. And she had another complete remission. And that lasted a year. And then she had a recurrence again and she got it again. By then, this drug has a name, Rituxan. Another complete remission. That lasted about seven years. So the first one a year, the second one a year, third one a year, seven years goes by. And she had a recurrence again, and she got it. Same drug again, now with, in, a, in a trial involving a combination with another drug. And she had a complete remission. Uh, in 2007, she was on maintenance therapy with these uh, drugs. And uh, she's 17 years from her original diagnosis. So there's several lessons here. One is phase two, phase one trials are closet phase two trials. Uh, this drug works repetitively again and again and again. And sometimes it works better the third or fourth time you use it than the first time you use it, which is a big surprise. There aren't many drugs that, that have that property work better later than earlier. And uh, this turns out to be a chronic disease now. We're talking about arthritis. We're talking about Allergies, we're talking about something you maintain and keep in remission again and again, and the person doesn't uh, succumb to the disease. So this is my other patient I want to present to you. Uh, uh, this is a mouse, uh, and it's a special mouse. It's a picture that I saw in 1975 when I was a student, uh, postdoc, and I was reading this journal, Nature, and I was really impressed with this, because this mouse is a, is a mouse without an immune system, and a human colon cancer tumor has been injected into the side of this mouse and is growing here. And the mouse has been injected with an antibody. And the antibody has radiation tagged onto it. And this is a picture, an uh, x-ray picture of that mouse. And it shows you the radiation kind of all clustering over here, localizing over here, 
which tells you that the antibody that was injected actually went to the tumor and stuck there and stayed there. Now, you don't need this picture to find this tumor. You can find this tumor on your own without some fancy technique. But what this established the principle that if you have the right antibody that can tell the difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell in the body, it can go there, it can stick there, it can drag radiation over there, it can deliver drugs over there, it might even do something on its own once it gets there. And this hooked me. I was hooked when I saw this picture. I said, we got to do this. Uh, so now we're on the, we're on the tape uh, 30 years forward, and this is a treatment we have in the clinic now, a radio-labeled monoclonal antibody, a patient with lymphoma injected here with this radiation-tagged antibody. And after about four hours, you see it's going all over the body. After about three days, you see it's kind of settling out over here. And after about six days, it's pretty much settled out, uh, just like that mouse, dragging the radiation right there to the tumor. And in a body a scan cross-section of the body, that tumor, the abnormal tumor is sitting right there. And that's where the radiation all went and treats that tumor. Oh, that's just a marker to uh, calibrate the machine to say it has to be this bright, so I know I'm taking the same brightness picture all three times. The question was, what's this dot over here? Not a part of the person. Okay, antibodies as drugs. This is the big success story of the immune system and cancer. In the beginning, it was thought that these antibodies could never be drugs. Why not? Because they were always different every time you made them and inject an animal and get the antibodies in the blood. Every, every rabbit is different, every, every donkey is different, and you get these things out of the blood, and every time you make it, it's, it's a mixture of all kinds of stuff, and you don't know how it is two times in a row. Um, that was solved by cloning the cells that make the antibodies, cloning the genes that, from those cells, and making one antibody at a time, monoclonal antibody, a single clone. They're big molecules. They're not little small molecules like arsenic like, or cyclopamine. They're big molecules. They, uh, they have a, a long time in the body, and, and that turns out to be some, a lot of an advantage in certain cases, because you don't have to keep giving it every hour. You give it once a week, once every month, lasts for a long time. It's a protein. You can't eat this stuff because you'll digest it in your, in your gut. You have to inject it. Uh, it's a natural product. See that dollar sign there? I'll come back to that in a minute. <laughs> turns out you make more money, doctors make more money injecting things than they do writing prescriptions for pills. Guess what the early adopters, the doctor early adopters, like best? Uh, it doesn't get inside the cells. It's not like arsenic or cyclopamine. It can't go inside the cell. It has to work from the outside of the cell. And that was a thought to be a disadvantage. But it turns out you can kill cells from the outside. And I'll show you how. Hard to make. These big proteins, it was you know, not so easy. Uh, but once you made the first one, it became a platform technology. And now everyone is made the same way. And it's easy to make these things, and each one has a different target that it goes after. It's a platform technology. They are originally foreign, now they're human, so they're not foreign to the body anymore. Uh, sometimes they were too specific, but you know, you can mix them together in specific cocktails. See that dollar sign again there? <laughs> so here's a partial list up to 2006. The first monoclonal antibody was approved by the FDA for use in human being for a disease in 1986. And I stopped making, you see why I stopped making this slide. I ran out of space here in 2006. So we have antibodies to treat transplant rejection, heart disease, autoimmune disease, infectious disease, allergy, uh, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis. But then there's some antibodies to treat cancer, B cell lymphoma, colon cancer, uh, leukemia, different kinds of leukemias, a whole cascade of new drugs that have come from this technology. And we go to clinic now. These are things are in the pharmacy. We write prescriptions for these things. And people are getting these things every day. So the basis for this discovery was uh, cloning the cells that make the antibodies. And it was discovered in 1975 uh, by these two people working in England, Kohler and Milstein, how to immortalize the cells that make the antibodies and grow them one at a time, make a clone of cells, all making the same antibody and living forever. So we have antibodies made from this technology that are uh, made from cells that were created 30 years ago and are still pumping out the same antibody that they were 30 years ago. We have them in the, in the laboratory. We have them in the pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, f um, facilities. And they make the same drug, the monoclonal antibody, that the original cell made 30 years ago, taken from a mouse or now from a human, human being. 
And the way this was done was to take the, the cell from the, from the mouse that's making the antibody that responds to this foreign or this molecule called an antigen and, and gluing it together, fusing it together with a cell that's from a cancer that lives forever. So we had immortality coming from the cancer cell and we had manufacture of a particular antibody coming from the immune cell, glue them together, they live forever and they make that antibody forever. Uh, this was an amazing breakthrough. They won the Nobel Prize for this, but they had no idea that they were making drugs. They were not the least bit interested in making drugs. Uh, they wanted to know how the immune system works. How is it wired when you put two cells together? Does one dominate over the other? Do the genes get together and work together? Or do they kick each other out, interfere with each other? They had basic scientific questions for doing this experiment. And when I talked to, talked to these people a few years later and told them we treated people with antibodies that came from their technology, they couldn't believe it. They just didn't believe it that we actually uh, had done that. So we decided to, when I became a, a, a beginning assistant professor here at Stanford, we decided we had a target on our cancer, some of our patients' cancer cells that we already knew was going to be there. All we had to do was make an antibody against it. And the target comes from the surface of the, uh, the antibody that every normal immune system cell makes. But when it becomes a cancer cell, one of those cells becomes a clone. And all of the cells of the clone, of the lymphoma, make exactly the same antibody with exactly the same portion here that distinguishes one from another in the normal uh, immune system cells. So we, if we can make an antibody against the antibody, a monoclonal antibody against the monoclonal antibody made by the tumor, we would have an antibody that could tell the difference between a cancer cell and a normal cell in the body. And so we did it. Uh, we made uh, a monoclonal antibody for a patient uh, with lymphoma. Uh, I went to my boss, uh, Saul Rosenberg, <laughs> and told him what I was going to do. And he gave me this advice. Uh, that wasn't the, 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 uh, the that wasn't what he that wasn't the, the the face he made when he told me not to do it. <laughs> so then I went to Henry Kaplan, uh, who was an amazing figure here at Stanford, historic figure, invented the use of radiotherapy for Hodgkin's disease, and was a pioneer of Stanford Medical School. And he told me this: uh, better work the first time, or you're going to be in trouble. Uh, actually, he was talking about one of his own experiments, I think. Uh, but uh, he gave me this advice. So he admonished me that it better be a good idea, better work, or you're going to be in trouble. So here's the first patient that we treated. Uh, his name is Philip Carr, and he also gave me permission. He actually appeared on the cover of a ma magazine five, five years later after we treated him when he was 72 years old. We made an antibody custom made for his tumor and treated him with it. And uh, here's the result. Now, when I show this to the medical students, at this point, I pass out the pointer. And I say, show me what's uh, wrong about this x-ray. And they, they freeze up. So I won't do that to you. <laughs> so this is before, this is after. This is a picture of the body, uh, the pelvis, and the spine. See the bones here? The legs down here. And what's been done here is a, is a substance that's been injected into the lymphatic channels of the toes. It trickles up into the lymph glands uh, in the pelvis and behind the abdomen, and you can see the dye. Uh, you can see the size of these lymph nodes here. The dye stays in there. You can take a picture. You can come later and take another picture, and a month later take another picture. The dye stays in there. This is called a lymphangiogram. Uh, it's a technology that has now disappeared from our uh, repertoire because the people who used to inject this dye into the feet of patients, uh, they, were, they were a specialized uh, group of people, and when they left the scene, nobody else knew how to do it anymore. Uh, we have other kinds of tests we use today. But what, the nice thing about this is you can compare this picture to that picture. So you see this big lymph node area here, and now it's shrunken down to this size over here. And similarly, this one over here is shrunken down to this over here. And uh, if you're really good at reading these, you can see the size of all these lymph nodes are shrunk down. This is close to normal size. Mr. Carr's x-ray. Uh, he went into a complete remission, and it lasted. Uh, he was treated when he was 67 years old. I last spoke to him he, uh, a couple years ago. He's in his late 90s now, uh, free of his lymphoma. So this is the, 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 the phase one trial that was the closet phase two. Because Mr. Carr motivated enormous amounts of investment and started the biotech industry all by himself. <laughs> so a company was founded called IDEC, IDEC Pharmaceuticals for Idiotype. 
uh, which is the name of the target that we used here. The problem with this idea is that we needed a different antibody for every person because every person had a different lymphoma with a different target, and we had to make a new antibody for everyone. And we did it about 50 times over the course of about 10 years, and not everyone had the great, as great a result as Philip Carr did, but uh, we had repetitive success. But the company got tired doing this. They said, we can never make any money on this custom approach. We have to find something one size fits all. And so they came up with this target called CD20, which is on lymphoma cells and normal B cells of the immune system. And they said, we're going to make an antibody against uh, that target because that would be good for everyone. And I said, that's a crazy idea. <laughs> and uh, you shouldn't do that because it's going to be on the normal cells too, not just the cancer cells. And I, I really like my idea better. Um, but they did it anyway. And we did the first trial here at Stanford. And uh, this was the pivotal trial. The FDA finally approved this drug uh, in 1997. Uh, where 166 patients were given this antibody against CD20 um, in a, uh, a study that was done all over the United States. 166 patients, and uh, about half of them had their uh, tumors respond. Uh, only a few of them were completely gone, and most of them partially gone. And this was never compared to anything. This was a phase two trial that was a closet phase three. Um, and the FDA approved this drug for the treatment of lymphoma, and uh, very remarkably so. So why did they do that? Why did they approve this drug for the treatment of lymphoma on a phase two trial and never compared to anything else? This is the reason. Charles Schultz knew the reason. Antibodies are wholesome, natural, without side effects. Uh, and that is pretty much true. <laughs> These things don't cause many side effects. So the ratio between efficacy and safety was so much in the favor of efficacy here, the FDA just proved it. And now everybody gets it. So Wendy Harpin uh, sum, summed it up when she said, could one single treatment that didn't make me bald or sick really get rid of the malignant lymphoma? Could we really hope for remission? And uh, it worked on her. Um, strangely enough, this antibody, which works, works on, the, on the tumor, also, as I predicted and counseled against using it, it also works on the normal immune system and ablates the normal B cells from the blood and takes them out of the blood and out of the tissues and out of the body. The normal B cells in the immune system also have that same target on them. And it stays away for about six months, maybe a year before they come back. It turns out to be safe to do that. And nobody could have predicted that in advance. Nobody could predict you could deal without your B cell immune system and not be able to make any new antibodies or infections that might come along and get away with that and make it and be safe. But it turns out, happily, it is safe. The other surprise was, as I showed you with Wendy Harpum, sometimes when you use this a second time, it works better than it does the first time. Uh, here's the kind of an average of a bunch of patients who are, had a remission that lasted about a year the first time, like she did. And the second time they got the, the treatment, it worked a year and a half. So it works better sometimes the second time than it does the first time. Another unpredictable good outcome. Uh, nobody could have uh, predicted that this would be the case. So how do you know when something works? <laughs> One way is you go around talking about it, and you go to meetings and show the results and brag about it and present papers. And in the beginning, uh, in 1994, at the end of 1994, we first reported the results of the clinical trial and Mr. Carr and, well, a few other people and Wendy Harpum. And, and then a few other people got a hold of the, of the antibody and, got, uh, and started using it. Some of these publications were ours. But once the FDA approved it, and everybody could get their hands on it, then it went through the roof. Look at this. Publications the next year uh, going wild. And that's still, you know, if I, if I extended this to the present time, that curve would go up to the sky. Uh, so many papers, so many people doing trials with this drug. So that's one way you know it, it works. Uh, here's the other way. <laughs> these, are the, these are the stock values of the two companies that were involved in developing this drug. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things about these curves. Um, for one, see this blue curve here? That's IDEC. Uh, see, it comes almost to zero here. Yeah. And we already knew that this antibody worked. Uh, the other thing is that uh, um, there's a lag here, as I'm just kind of implying, between when, when we scientists knew it worked, but the investors did not. Uh, this is not called inside information. All you have to do is read the, read the journals, read the medical literature, and you can be ahead of the game in uh, 
make a lot of money. You didn't need inside information. This is public information here, this red curve. And uh, there's a lot of money to be made knowing about that. The other thing is that, see, uh, Genentech, the other one is Genentech here. Uh, Genentech went off the stock market for a while because they were going to be taken over by Roche at the time. But uh, the fact that they uh, made the deal with IDEC and co-marketed this drug saved both companies from going out of existence. And uh, it's a big, that's how you know things really work. Well, the real way you know things work is when they get adopted in the community. Um, the FDA approved this drug originally for one kind of lymphoma in one kind of situation after regular treatments had, had been exhausted and didn't work anymore. But once people got a hold of this and was in the pharmacy and you could do clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, with the drug being available, approved by the FDA, proven safe already, they could check it in other situations. How about giving it to people who never had any other therapy before so they could avoid chemotherapy? How about giving it after chemotherapy? How about giving it combined with chemotherapy? How about giving it forever as a maintenance therapy? And I showed you Wendy Harpin's case in which she had many of these forms of use of this drug. And phase two and phase three clinical trials have been done, and all of these have proven uh, to be uh, worthwhile. And so this has become an amazing blockbuster drug. It's the biggest selling cancer drug in the world right now. And I want to show you some of the data that led to, to those conclusions. This is a phase three trial done in France in patients with lymphoma, elderly patients in this case, uh, who got the usual chemotherapy, or they got, uh, on a coin flip, they got the usual chemotherapy together with this antibody. And look how much better. This is the time here in years. This is the recurrence of the disease or death from the lymphoma. And look how much better the people did who got the additional treatment added to the standard treatment as a combination therapy. Uh, this result has become uh, the standard uh, of care throughout the world now uh, for lymphoma. Everyone pretty much gets that treatment now. Here's another trial, a phase three trial, in which patients were given chemotherapy first, they got to remission, and then they were given maintenance treatment with the antibody. And here's the superior outcome uh, in terms of staying in remission uh, over those who did not get the antibody. And here's overall survival. They were actually living longer than those who did not uh, get the antibody drug. So different ways of using it were found. Clinical investigators could try it in new ways and get new indications for this treatment. Now here's a, a, a series of patients treated in the United States, in southeastern United States, where they're giving the antibody uh, prior to receiving any other treatments, the first treatment at the time they were originally diagnosed, and shows the outcome of a group of patients who are out uh, several years now have never had to have chemotherapy, never had to lose their hair or have uh, nausea and vomiting from chemotherapy. Uh, so all of these ways of using this drug have, uh, have promulgated uh, uh, the acceptance in the community. Remember that dollar sign I showed you before? Uh, the doctors love this drug. It doesn't cause anybody to get sick, and you can combine it with other treatments, and you can collect them a lot of money for giving it. So um, up till now, everything's pretty much obvious. We've treated cancer with a targeted uh, agent, an antibody. You inject it, it goes to the tumor, kills the tumor. Uh, but what was really a surprise is that this antibody, this drug, works in other kinds of diseases, autoimmune diseases of several kinds. Uh, diseases involving the immune system, multiple sclerosis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, all of these have found use, uh, uh, productive use of this treatment and are now, uh, some of them, approved by the FDA uh, for using these drugs. So we're way beyond lymphoma, we're way beyond cancer. We're into the immune system now and diseases of the immune system that are ameliorated by this drug. So how does it work? We don't really know, but these are some of the ideas of how it works. I told you, it's not like arsenic or cyclopamine. It doesn't go inside the cell. It stays on the outside and binds to its target on the outside of the cell. And it might deliver a signal, just like the signal that you heard about with the uh, hedgehog pathway. It might deliver a signal to the cell to uh, suicide and die, just from binding to the outside and triggering that receptor on the outside. Uh, it might attract other proteins from the blood that uh, chew up the, the membrane of the target cell once they see the antibody is sitting on there. It might attract other cells in the body that do the killing by releasing toxins and kill a tumor cell by being activated uh, by seeing the antibody sitting there and binding to the back end through a special receptor. Uh, or it might 
cause the tumor cell to be engulfed by other cells that chew it up, present it to the immune system, and induce an immune response against the tumor. That might account for why the drug works better the second time than it does the first time. You might be boosting an immune response rather than directly treating the tumor. Uh, most of the evidence suggests that this is the way it works, uh, and I can go over that if we want to talk about it. But, but there are uh, new ideas for how to make it work better by, uh, by uh, jazzing up the back end here so it binds to this receptor on the killer cell better and becomes a more effective killer. So I think I'll skip over the evidence for that, and we can come back to it if we need to. So the pipeline, uh, once something succeeds, uh, a lot of people get interested in trying to copy it, uh, improving it uh, by making a better binder to the killer cell, uh, making a better binder to the target, or other antibodies against other targets that are present on the, the tumor cell. The pipeline is, is um, stuffed with candidates that are crying for clinical trials and patients to join, and uh, we get back into some of the ethical issues that I described before. Uh, how are we going to figure out whether any of these are any better than the first one? The FDA approved the first one. These other guys have to get in there and prove that they're equally or good or better. So antibodies are huge success. They're effective drugs. Um, and we'll find replacements eventually for these first ones. Uh, we need to to drive the price down by competition. Uh, there's a monopoly right now on this, and, and we have to break that monopoly by finding replacements or better versions. We'll find new diseases to treat, and we have. I've shown you the, the, the way that works. We have to figure out really how it works and why it doesn't work in everybody and why it stops working in some people. And eventually, we might be able to push chemotherapy uh, into the background by using the immune system uh, in this way. So uh, I have uh, another story to tell you about vaccines, which aren't so successful so far, uh, really on the drawing board still, the, the new kid on the block. But I think I'll stop there and see if there are any questions about uh, what I've said so far. Yes? A great question about if the original idea that targeted the tumor and not the normal immune, uh, body uh, cells was a better idea, then why don't we, why don't we do that? Because it would have less side effects potentially. And I agree with the question. I think it's still a better idea. I think it's still potentially a better treatment than the one I'm describing that got approved. But how much would we, would we be willing to pay for it? Uh, in England, they've put a price tag on uh, what new treatments will be reimbursed by the health uh, system of England. $50,000 a year for uh, a year of, of uh, quality, quality life extended. If it costs more than $50,000 a year, the system, the bank is broken and they can't afford to pay for it. Uh, if we, uh, I think we could produce this for $50,000 a year, and I think it extends life uh, on the average more than a year. So I think it, it could be done. Uh, I think that it would take some imagination for how to, uh, how to pull it off and how to attract the investment that it would take. But I still think it's a better idea. I think the technology in 30 years has advanced, so it's, it's faster to find and make the new antibodies than it was back then. But the real cost of doing this is putting it in the bottle and putting a label in the bottle to the specs of the FDA. The quality control, uh, the assurances that you really got the right thing in the bottle, that it's not somebody else's antibody, uh, and that... Uh, the chain of custody is intact, and all of the checks and balances on the safety of individually produced products are re really where the cost is, not in making the biologic agent anymore. Uh, but I, I, like the, I, I like the suggestion. I, I'm still working on this, actually. I've got some ideas about how to make it faster and cheaper. So the question is, is autoimmunity and cancer two sides of the same coin? And it absolutely is. Uh, we really think that the immune system evolved to protect us against the invaders from the outside, not so much against the cancer invaders from the inside. Um, but if we rev up the immune system too much, uh, it might go haywire and attack our, our own bodies uh, and cause autoimmunity. And that really uh, relates to the next topic I want to talk about, which is vaccines, where we're trying to push the immune system to do something. The question is, that if you have an autoimmune condition, does that make you more or less susceptible to getting cancer? There are some associations between some kinds of autoimmunity and some kinds of cancer. Um, but by and large, by and large, uh, you are not more susceptible to getting the usual kinds of cancer. There are some special kinds and special diseases that are related. Uh, but by and large, it's not, it's not a... Um, it's not a, a driver of, of the cancer process. Great question. So the question is, uh, do we fail because of stem cells that, of the tumor 
that escape the treatment that we're doing. And the antibodies, can they be directed against the stem cells of the tumor uh, in addition to maybe the other cells of the tumor? So there are two, there are two schools of thought on this. One is uh, the stem cell hypothesis, let's call it, that the cancer is fed by a few cells that have the self-renewing potential that you heard about, and that uh, we got to get those few cells that will never make any progress against the cancer. The other school of thought is that all the cells in the cancer can be a stem cell uh, at one mo moment in time or another, and we really got to get them all. We can't just get those few that today are behaving like stem cells. Uh, there's room for, for uh, strategies around both ideas. Uh, the stem cell people are trying to make antibodies against those stem cells, uh, and the every cell got to be targeted. People are loading up their antibodies with things that kill. No matter what they see, they kill everything in the vicinity, kind of a, a blanket uh, killing approach by the antibodies. And I think that uh, in certain circumstances, either one of these could be more correct than the other, but the strategies uh, could actually be designed to cover both possibilities. The question is, can we make a uh, can we pick targets that are, that are true for all cancers and not just specific for one kind or another? So we have the, the really extremes here. We have the, the, the target that's only on one person. We've got to make a new antibody for that each person. And then there's the kind that, uh, let's say, an oncogene or tumor suppressor gene, like you heard about, that's the basis for many kinds of cancers. And we go after that pathway or that, that gene. It's repetitively the cause of many kinds of cancers and, and have one size fits all. And again, just like the answer I just gave, each circumstance might, uh, each might be the case in a different circumstance. And, and we're starting to learn, actually, about how to subdivide the, the cancers <coughs> into, into groups that are caused by certain pathways or certain mutated genes. And we have drugs that are for not, that, not for colon, not for breast, not for lung, but for the pathway or the, or the mutated gene that might be shared by subsets of each of these kinds of cancers. So the question is, uh, uh, everything I said so far was the, about the United States and the F FDA, and uh, what about the rest of the world where maybe the rules and regulations are less uh, restrictive and more, more lax? Uh, are there any ethicists in the audience? <laughs> <laughs> so we get into the ethical issue now about uh, uh, if we went somewhere where they didn't have those rules and we violated our current rules by going out offshore and got some result, could we come back with those data and show them to the FDA and say, see, it works. And no matter, don't ask us how we got this data, uh, but we see it works. I, I, I think we're in a situation now where we'd at least be forced to replicate the result uh, under the restrictions and guidelines that we live under here. Uh, the other aspect of this is that it costs enormous amounts of money and time to go through this process and prove to the, uh, our regulatory authorities that things work. And it makes things expensive when they're finally approved. Companies that invest all this money, got to re they, have to get a, they have to pay back the bills that it took to get them there, and they have to charge a lot for these treatments when they finally get approved. Can they afford to go to the third world and give away their drugs? Um, and uh, that's a serious problem. I, I think they can't really afford to do that, um, and so we have to find a way to export our regulations so that the data we get from places where it's not as expensive to do the work can be uh, acceptable in the regulatory process that we have here. And maybe we can take advantage of, of some of the attributes of both and still stay ethical. It's a long-winded answer. It's an interesting question. How much, how much harm can we afford to do for the sake of doing good? Or put it another way, uh, if we relaxed our standards and uh, had our levels of certainty reduced, uh, to get drugs approved, maybe more people would quickly get access to these things and we could do more benefit than waiting till we could go through all these years of proving that something works. And meantime, all these people who could have benefited uh, might get access to drugs. This is a huge debate that's going on continually. And, and I, I must say that when I go uh, get a treatment myself, I'm kind of thankful that we have an FDA that makes people prove that things work uh, before someone gives it to me or charges my insurance company a lot of money to pay for it. So uh, on balance, I, I've bashed the FDA a lot here, told you how hard it is to do this, but I don't think we want to do without these, uh, these restrictions on, on uh, uh, proving efficacy and safety. Uh, I don't know if we have it right now, but we certainly have it expensive now, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, the question is, if the foreign country has, has uh, safeguards and standards like we do, 
is the data that we get by doing trials there acceptable here in this country? And the answer is yes. Many drugs have been approved by data from France and Germany and Japan and uh, uh, countries that have the same kinds of uh, rigor and uh, ethical standards. Uh, so I'll repeat the question. What about cutting off the blood supply to tumors so they don't have nourishment? And this is actually a strategy that's used in the clinic today by an antibody that targets a molecule that feeds the blood vessels. And uh, the tumors have more blood vessels than their normal tissues. And this is a treatment, uh, kind of one-size-fits-all treatment for all kinds of cancer, potentially. It's called Avastin. Avastin. Uh, I think I'll move on and, and uh, finish up with the examples that aren't yet available as uh, approved drugs. Vaccines. Not to prevent cancer. If we actually knew which cancer everybody was going to get, maybe we could figure out how to develop a vaccine to prevent it. But I'm talking about vaccines that retrain the immune system uh, that lost the battle already against the cancer to start paying attention and go fight the cancer. So I'll give you an example of something going on here in the clinic actually today a trial where we are doing something to patients, in this case with lymphoma, but it could be any kind of cancer, <laughs> where we take one site in the body where the cancer is and we inject into the tumor a compound that stimulates the immune system. And we also give a little radiation to kill some cancer cells. So they spill their guts, spill their guts, release their contents, and the immune system is sitting right there getting, getting uh, pushed on by this stimulant. And we get the immune system revved up, and then it goes all over the body looking for things to kill, Hopefully, not the normal tissues and autoimmunity, but rather the specific cancer cells that are in other places in the body where we didn't do any, any intervention. So here's an example. Uh, this is a person. This is an x-ray through the chest. Uh, and you're seeing the top of the heart here, the spine. And this is under the armpits. And this is the abnormality here, these uh, lumps under here and under here. We're treating a place in the back of the neck, and we're looking under the armpits. And so over time, you can watch these things get better and go away. 24 weeks, everything gone. A complete remission induced in a person by injecting an immune stimulant into one, uh, cancer in one place in the body, triggering the immune system to uh, pay attention, go after, and try to kill cancer cells in other places in the body. That's a clinical trial going on right now. We're having some success. We're far away from approval by the FDA. Uh, this is, I guess you would call a, a phase one slash two trial. Uh, we're trying to figure out whether it's safe. We're trying to figure out what the dose is. But we're really trying to watch something good happen if we can catalog that too. Uh, a bunch of people have had this treatment. And every time the line goes down, it's a, every, oops, everyone is a person. If it goes down, the sh tumor shrunk. If it goes up, the tumor grew. See, most of them are shrinking. So that's kind of a example of a phase two result in a phase one trial. Something we're very excited about and I uh, think we're on uh, track of something good here. This is something that got approved last week by the FDA. This is prostate cancer. A clinical trial where people were randomized on a two to one basis. Uh, this is how we deal with some of the ethics. It's not a coin flip. <laughs> it's like two coins and one coin. And you got two chances to get the real stuff and one chance to get the placebo. And then we find out uh, uh, what happens to the tumors. Then we find out how long people live. And the interesting thing was the original endpoint uh, uh, thing they were trying to get uh, the FDA approve them on was what happens to the tumors. And there was no difference in measuring the tumors. They grew, they shrunk, they stayed the same. They were all kind of the same. So the treatment didn't seem to work. And then uh, about a year went by, and they went and checked on those people again. They found out that uh, by survival, the people who got the real stuff were actually living longer. And they went back to the FDA and they said, please give us an approval. And the FDA says, ooh, that's very interesting. But you didn't tell us you were going to look at survival before you started the experiment. You told us you are going to look at progression. And so if you want to prove that, you better go do another trial and prove survival. And there was a huge controversy about this, very emotional uh, debate at the FDA. Uh, the company went back and did another trial and proved it. And last week, they got approval for the drug. Now uh, we can uh, do this in our clinics, and, and the company can charge money for it, and it's approved by the FDA. Here's the result. So this is survival of the patients. And this is months down here. And the yellow curve is the people who got the, the vaccine that induced the immune response. 
and the gray curve here is the control got the placebo. So there's really a strong statistical uh, proof here that uh, there was a benefit to the people who got the, the vaccine. They lived on the average of four months longer. So how much does this cost? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this costs $100,000 to, to live four months longer. This will not be approved in England, I guarantee you. And there's a huge debate now about uh, what do we get for our money here? And is this worth it? Should the FDA have approved this dr uh, drug? And uh, is this something we should brag about? Is this a success story? Uh, after all, these people are still dying at the end here. Um, and I think we're about to see what happens with this experiment in society that has to make choices about how we use uh, uh, the amount of resources we have and uh, whether we can afford to pay bills like this for this degree of benefit. Statistically speaking, this is a big win. It's the first time that a vaccine has been approved, a therapeutic vaccine has been approved to treat uh, cancer in people. Uh, hopefully we can make this better now our foot is in the door. Remember what happens over Texan. Once our foot was in the door, uh, we extended it, we made it better, we understood it better, um, and uh, we were on the verge of something great, even though in the beginning it wasn't so great. We hope we're at that stage here, and we hope we'll have more examples of this in the future uh, with ideas for how to train, retrain the immune system to fight the cancer uh, so that people can live even longer than this. So in, in the words of Wendy Harpham, uh, the textbooks are wrong. As long as there is research, my type of lymphoma is not incurable. It is one of the types for which scientists are working toward a cure. And I want to list a bunch of people who've worked with me over the years on the problems and the projects and the outcomes and the analysis that I described here. Um, students, postdoctoral fellows, uh, doctors in training, and uh, people who devoted and are devoting their careers uh, to this enterprise. Um, and uh, a list of names is only one thing. What they look like is another. <laughs> uh, this is lab, Levy Lab meeting uh, 20 years ago or so. And, uh, most of the people in this picture are now heads of departments and, and very successful scientists and, and uh, uh, going out and curing cancer in the world. Uh, these are Wendy Haveron's children when she was diagnosed with lymphoma. Uh, this is their picture recently. Here's Wendy and her kids grew up and she got to see it. And this is a cartoon <laughs> that was written. Uh, <laughs> quite a long time ago. It says, take some antibodies and call me in the morning. And when I first saw this cartoon, I, I wanted to make a slide of it, and I showed it in my lectures. And over the years, I've noticed that I've become to look like this guy. <laughs> so I think I'll stop there, and, and maybe we have some more discussion. Thank you very much. I think you can see, when you read in the newspaper, there's been a big debate about the NCI and clinical trials, and has it been a failure, and Dr. Varmus just got hired to go in and really radically change this. You've heard from two people what incredible amount of work that this takes, from going from the cell, the protein, the signals, all the way up through the incredible process to put this into patients. This is truly what we're trying to do at Stanford, bench to bedside translational, and the courage of people who are willing to take the chance. And it is, it's just a miraculous thing, and I think Dr. Levy's explained uh, that process, I think, better than I've ever seen anybody do it. I've never thought of a phase one as a closet uh, phase two, but you're right, it is. And um, I'm sure the speakers will be happy to take some questions afterwards up here, but we'll let people go since it's on time. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.